Hello and welcome to the Just and Center podcast. I am your host, Pastor Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me on the program today. Just a quick reminder that you can help support the things that we do here by going to justincenter.com. You can either sign up through Patreon to help us every month or through PayPal to give a donation to continue to help us do the things that we do here. Um, Now, on the program today, uh, I, I wanted to well, I'm dealing with something that someone has asked me about uh, and wanted me to deal with. And um, this is actually something that I've been asked about multiple times in the past. Um, and I, I haven't responded to this uh, certain comments uh, by a certain individual, um, even though I've been pointed at several comments in the past. But, you know, I, I've been asked so much um, that I decided maybe it was a good idea to respond. Um, And that is that somebody sent me comments uh, from James White, uh, the Reformed Baptist, uh, James White, on the subject of uh, Lutheranism. And there were comments, I guess he's teaching a church history class at his his, uh, church. And, you know, I I do feel a little strange responding to something that was obviously meant to be for congregational purposes, not really something polemical. But um, the the statements that were made there are ones that he has made in all sorts of different formats as well. And I guess he's he's really made these comments on his show before, too. Um, and, And I think some of those comments have led to some weird views of Lutheranism, because the comments that you're going to hear, um, these are ones that I've heard from people who ask me about Lutheranism, and they think, oh, Lutheranism is this, this, and this, and, and I say, what are you talking about? And they say, oh, we heard that from James White. So, um, you know, this is a practical thing, and I know a lot of people listen to his his program. It's, it's popular enough that uh, there are people that I encounter on, on a regular basis online who have weird ideas about Lutheranism, uh, and they definitely get it uh, from there. Now, um, I would encourage you because this is going to be on a similar topic, to, to listen to the last program that I did, which was on the subject of faith and reason uh, within Lutheran thought. And uh, why I encourage you to do that is because uh, this gets in another kind of caricature of Lutheranism that's often thrown out there. So the, the topic that I'm dealing with today is dealing with caricatures of Lutheranism and, and common misconceptions of Lutheranism. And the the comments I'm going to be playing here, these were from uh, Dr. James White. He gave these comments uh, at a, some kind of Bible study class that he hosts after church. He's going through a, a series on church history. Now, this wasn't on Lutheranism. It was, and, and I did listen to the whole program because I wanted to get the context of what, what was going on. Um, he was dealing with uh, Ignatius uh, you know, the early church, the early church father Ignatius, not not Ignatius Loyola, but he was dealing with Ignatius and some of his comments about the real presence of Christ in the supper. Um, and he was dealing with the doctrine of transubstantiation and the arguments that transubstantiation is present there. Um, I definitely had some comments on that section that I really would like to, <laughs> some things I'd really like to say there too, but, um, you know, we'll kind of leave that alone because I want to make sure we, we delve into what we're going to delve into. But uh, in this interaction, there was a, uh, a question that was asked by somebody, you know, in the congregation or in the Bible study, and they were asking about uh, the Lutheran view uh, in response to kind of the Roman Catholic view and, and some of Ignatius's uh, comments about those who deny the body of our Lord. So, uh, and then Dr. James White kind of makes a very brief uh, set of comments. Um, and like I said, it's not that he misspoke here because he's made these similar comments in all sorts of other places. Um, and, you know, I think it just becomes apparent that, you know, sometimes people speak about things they don't know about. Um, and, and I think it's pretty clear that, uh, that James White is not really familiar with Lutheranism, even in the, in the slightest. I, I don't think he's read our confessional documents or anything, um, because it's very clear from the comments that he's made that he really doesn't even have the slightest uh, idea of, of where, really where Lutherans are coming from, or even the landscape of Lutheranism or, or confessional Lutheranism. And so he's made some very bizarre comments. I, I don't know where these comments come from. I don't know where he's getting these ideas from. Um, what I do know is I've heard them repeated over and over and over again. Uh, you know, I was, I remember being at a wedding one time and I just was sitting with a, you know, at, at a table with someone I didn't know. And, uh, you know, they introduced themselves and they asked, you know, I introduced myself and I said I was, um, this is, I was in seminary at the time and I said I was becoming a Lutheran pastor. And the first guy's comments was, oh, so you're really more of a Melanchthonian than a Lutheran because I learned that from James White. <laughs> And I said, what? What <laughs> What are you talking about? Um, and, and so, you know, th- this is a common thing that, that you'll run across for those who are kind of in those circles. So um, I, I want to interact with some of these comments. Now, I'm just going to play them uh, piece 
piece by piece. There's a lot of comments on each part that I have, and so I'm just going to jump into it uh, by getting at uh, playing the first part of the clip, and then I'm going to, to play the rest and make further comments. Um, so here we go. This is Dr. James White answering a question about exactly what it is that Lutherans believe on the subject of the real presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Well, we'll get to that. We will cover that probably sometime in 2017. Um, no, seriously, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, Brisbane, Sydney, New Zealand, uh, yeah, it'll probably be 2017, I've, I've got a little more traveling yet to do this year, um, but, uh, just, just very, very briefly, there's more than one understanding amongst modern day Lutherans, because you need to understand that there are liberal Lutherans, conservative Lutherans, and then historically, all right, I'm just going to stop right there uh, before we get to the next little comment that he makes. But um, so he makes the point that, you know, the question was about uh, what Lutheran views of the Lord's Supper are. And then he basically says, well, there are all sorts of Lutheran views. So you can't really pin them down on anything. Now, this just simply is not true. Um, there might be little differences among Lutherans on various little points of things. Um, but, and, and, you know, we, we can kind of... Um, do that with any theological tradition, right? Even the idea of transubstantiation, there are various nuances of what that means from various Roman Catholic scholars. Uh, and there was a big debate in the 20th century over, over some of those things, especially in terms of, you know, Thomist philosophy and other possible ways of explaining those things through other philosophical systems. Um, but the point is, you know, yeah, there's little disagreements maybe, but in terms of the larger picture, there is not a disagreement. Um, and, you know, he cites, well, there are conservative and liberal Lutherans. Well, first of all, I think that's kind of a strange thing to do, um, because when you define Reformed theology, you know, they're not saying, well, there are the there's the PCUSA and then there's the PCA and they're both Reformed. I think generally in more conservative cir circles, usually it's understood that when you speak of Reformed or Calvinistic, you're not speaking of someone like Karl Barth, you're speaking probably probably of the more confessional side of the tradition. Usually you'll say something like a Bardian, you're, you'll make a, a, a distinction when you're talking about those churches that kind of branch off from, from there, but definitely have different convictions than maybe a more strict confessionalism. So you, you should do the same thing with Lutheranism. So you can't say, well, there's the ELCA and, you know, they believe all sorts of stuff. Some ELCA church had a, you know, a a pagan priestess come to their church service, therefore Lutherans support that. Well, of course, that's silly, because we're defined by our confessional tradition. You could find an extreme liberal church that does whatever they want, and, and that doesn't define their tradition. And I think um, we recognize that uh, with the Reformed world, so why would we not do that with Lutherans? But either way, there, this is this kind of uh, picture of Lutheranism, that we are this wide tent, that we don't really have any specifics tied down. We're all in a bunch of disagreement over these issues. And, you know, one thing I would say is that in terms of the Lord's Supper, I have not run into disagreement even among, you know, really LCMS and ELCA people in terms of the nature of Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper, amazingly. Uh, not to say that that's not there at all, um, but generally that's one of the things in Lutheranism that even the most liberal Lutherans tend to hold on to because it was definitional for the Lutheran Reformation. So even there, there's really not going to be a huge difference in terms of, of the reality of Christ's presence. And yeah, there have been Lutherans in the past, you know, you had Simon uh, Schmucker who adopted a reform view of the Lord's Supper um, and altered the Augsburg Confession, but uh, it was pretty well recognized, even by his own synod, by the way, um, that he was not really much of a Lutheran at all. Uh, I mean, if you're going to interpret anyone who sticks a name to themselves as that tradition, then every tradition can be as broad as you want it to be, because there's people that claim names of all sorts of things that believe all sorts of stuff. So we have to define the different traditions by their confessional documents and by what they have taught historically through those through those documents. Um, and there's no ambiguity. There's not ambiguity at all uh, among Lutherans, especially we're talking about confessional Lutherans. We all believe that Christ's body and blood are truly present uh, in the Lord's Supper, that we receive them under the forms of bread and wine, as the Augsburg Confession states. And, uh, you know, generally Lutherans have been defined especially by their adherence to the unaltered Augsburg Confession, as opposed to the altered one that Melanchthon um, later helped author, which we'll actually get into uh, a little bit because that's relevant to our topic as well. Um, and that is very clear about, about these issues. Now, yeah, there might be differences in terms of consecrationism and receptionism, um, but that debate doesn't really get to the heart of what the differences are between the Lutheran and Reformed views. Uh, so 
the point is just wrong. It's just false. It, it's simply not true. It, it betrays a very clear misunderstanding um, of just the landscape of what Lutheranism is and how we're defined. In reality, you're going to find way more a divergence among Reformed authors and people than you'll find among Lutherans. Um, I mean, I find, you know, you'll, you'll see in some reform groups online, you know, people will define themselves. Well, what do you believe? And they'll say, well, I am a, you know, I'm a post-millennial uh, cessationist, uh, theonomic, um, five-point Calvinist, super lapsarian, you know, and, and uh, credo Baptist. You know, you'll have all of these various points, and this will all be under Reformed. So we have to define what we mean even more specifically than just Reformed because it doesn't mean one specific thing. So not even one eschatological view or, or and all these other issues. And in Lutheran circles, you don't get that because we actually have agreement with our confessions. Um, because uh, among, you know, confessional Lutheran traditions, at least, we hold a quia subscription to the confessions, which means uh, that we don't leave room for divergence from our confessions at all. And things like eschatology, we have a unified view. Uh, you can't be a Lutheran theonomist. You can't, you know, you can't have all of these various views. And there's always going to be disagreement, of course. Not every Lutheran is identical. But in the broad spectrum of things, we are way more consistent of a tradition than the Reformed are. I mean, way more consistent. Um, so the, the claim is just very bizarre. So I'm going to play the next comment here. There are many Luthers. All right, and I'm stopping there. Um, that's a short comment, but 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 this is an idea that he's expressed before. And like I said, I've, I've been pointed to podcasts and things that he's done where he's mentioned some of this. There was a, a church history series that he did a long time ago um, as well. I don't know if that was at his congregation or somewhere else that someone sent me a long time ago, and, and he said basically the same thing. But the argument here is, well, Luther is not consistent with himself, and when we say Luther, there's many Luthers. Luther kind of just changed his views all over the place. And you find this numerous times in, in what, what he states. Now, I, I don't know where he's getting this from. I'd ask what Luther scholars he's read. Um, I'd ask what Luther he's read and what time periods and, and uh, what scholars he can find that hold this view that Luther just changed his mind all the time and was not consistent at all with his own thoughts. Um, it, it, it's simply not consistent with reading Luther either. There's no like flip-flop, especially when we're talking about the issue of the Lord's Supper. There's no like, oh, Luther believed in the real presence here. Oh, he didn't hear. Oh, he did hear. Oh, he did hear. You know, it, it, there, there's no switching. It, it, Luther's view of the Lord's Supper is very consistent throughout his whole life. And you can find, sure, development of doctrine in certain things. Um, but read his, his, you know, Reformation treatises of, you know, 1520, uh, Babylonian Captivity of the Church, and then read his last writings. What he says about the Lord's Supper does not fundamentally change ever. There's no divergence in Luther over his view of the Lord's Supper. And I've read numerous, you know, published articles and books by, you know, the most prominent Luther scholars in the world on the subject of the Lord's Supper, and I've never seen one of them make the argument that Luther, there's some kind of continual discontinuity in Luther's thought over this issue of the Lord's Supper. So I would ask, where is he getting this from? Tell me the scholars that are arguing this. Demonstrate this in Luther's own writings where this is the case. And I simply think that it's he's mistaken. I don't know where he got this from. I don't know if he heard it from somebody. Or is this just an attempt to make Luther a Calvinist to say, well, he was inconsistent with himself. He was really just a Calvinist because that's stuff you hear all the time about Luther. Luther was really basically just a Calvinist. Luther's uh, Lutherans don't follow Luther. Calvinists do, which is weird. But um, and then he goes on to mention later the Marburg colloquy where Luther pretty clearly said, if you don't agree with me on the Lord's Supper, we can't have fellowship because the issue was that important. Um, and that's a consistent thing in, in Luther's ideas. Now, Luther is not you know, all over the place uh, throughout his writings. There, there definitely is a development in his thought. Um, you know, there's development in Calvin's thought as you read uh, the early editions of the Institutes to the latter, but um, there's not a fundamental theological shift, you know, in Calvin, and, and it's the same way in Luther. There, there's no fundamental ideological shift from early Luther to late Luther. Uh, now, there are going to be differences because certain emphases are going to change. The controversies are going to change. He's going to think more thoroughly about certain issues. Um, for example, I, I think that if you look at his statements regarding the law in, in Luther's early life, uh, you could come away with the conclusion that Luther does not hold to a, a third use of the law. Um, but by the late 1520s, I think it's very clear that he does, especially as you read, read the large catechism. And there's historical reasons for that, because you had the Saxon visitations where he sees that there's, are, you know, there's immorality in the churches and things like that, and, and, and he recognizes that maybe he should be uh, teaching on you know, issues of what we call sanctification today a little more. So, so there is you know, 
there there are shifts in teaching and what he says and things like that. Um, his harsh criticisms of Aristotle, for example, are more early Luther than they are late Luther. Um, but that all has to do with the battles that he was fighting. Now, of course, he was in a process of shifting his thoughts from, you know, medieval Roman Catholicism with his nominalist training in particular to a fully formed Reformation theology. But the roots of the Reformation theology that are there, even as early as, you know, 1512, when he's lecturing on uh, on the Psalms, a lot of the themes are, are already present there, and they develop more. And yes, of course, they develop more. But, but by, you know, about 1520, the major ideas in Luther's thought are really all there. There's not a huge amount of divergence from, you know, the 1520 Luther of the freedom of a Christian in Babylonian captivity and the 1535 Luther of the, the great Galatians commentary from his uh, Galatians lectures. There, there really is not a, a broad divergence of thought there at all. You might find a shift in themes, a shift in, in the way he speaks sometimes, but really th- it's the same Luther. Now, yes, you can find and maybe what's being said is, uh, Luther can make extreme statements that make him sound like he's contradicting himself, but but that's just Luther's rhetorical flourish, um, which is very common in Luther. He often overstates his case, um, but that doesn't that doesn't mean a contradiction in ideology. That's just that's just the product of Luther's rhetoric, and I think that Luther scholars understand that. So um, this idea that there are many Luthers is simply not true. Yes, there is a early Luther, yes, there is a late Luther, and the early Luther develops into the late Luther. Um, But once he makes his Reformation discovery, there is no fundamental theological shift from that point forward. Um, There might be little things that begin to fall more into place with his Reformation discovery, but especially sacramentally. There's no difference sacramentally. I mean, for the early Luther— as well as the late Luther, really the, the theology of baptism is, is foundational for his doctrine of justification, as someone like Philip Carey has has demonstrated. Um, so that really the doctrine of justification for Luther is founded on the promise that God gives in baptism as a true and objective everlasting promise. Um, and so the sacraments are intimately tied to his Re- Reformation breakthrough itself, and so you really can't divorce those two things. So, you know, I'm at a loss as to where he's getting this from. Maybe some further comments are made somewhere else where he explains where this is from, um, but it's it, the statements are just demonstrably false. And modern Lutheranism is much more modern Melanchthonianism than it is Lutheranism. Melanchthon, Philip Melanchthon was Luther's successor, and in many ways— Modern Lutheranism is more Melanchthon than it is Luther. According to what? This is the claim that really drives me bonkers because it's just not true. So the modern Lutheranism is really Melanchthonianism, not really Lutheranism. And and I get the, the feeling that the implication here is Luther was really a Calvinist, and those Lutherans really followed that guy Melanchthon, which is weird, because Cal- Melanchthon was the one that the Lutherans called, uh, you know, Ignatio, uh, or a, sorry, a crypto-Calvinist. Um, it was Melanchthon who associated with Calvin, and the Lutherans who wrote our confessions were actually very critical of Melanchthon, who was the one who was actually closer to Calvinism on a lot of issues than uh, Luther was. Um, so it's just a weird claim, and, and again, just shows that he doesn't know what he's talking about on this issue. And I'm sorry to be that blunt, but he has no idea what he's talking about. Um, and that doesn't mean he doesn't know what he's talking about on other issues. But but on this issue, you know, he has he's he's as wrong as Dave Hunt is in portraying what Calvinism is. Okay, it's that bad, at least that bad. Um, and even a quick read of our confessions at all would demonstrate this, or, or a short read of a chapter on the development of Lutheran history and the formation of the Book of Concord uh, in a church history book, a Reformation history book, you know, anything um, w- would demonstrate that this is false. Now, y- you have to, when, when you're trying to make this divergence between Luther and Melanchthon, you, you have to say in, in what way you're, you're making that distinction. Um, it, and I don't think that Dr. White is making this distinction in the way that a lot of 20th century Luther scholars did. Now, there there was a push in, in Luther scholarship, and especially this is true um, coming from Albert Ritual, um, the, the Protestant liberal theologian of the 19th century. Uh, Ritual really liked Luther. Uh, he really combined Luther with, with Kant, more so 
uh, with Hermann Lotze, who was a, a, a disciple of Kant, somebody, he was a neo-Kantian philosopher. Um, in, in other words, he took some of Immanuel Kant's ideas and then he uh, modified them in different ways. Um, and then Albert Ritschel kind of takes some of those, combines them with Luther's theology and comes up with his own unique theological system, rejecting traditional metaphysics and things like that. And uh, with Ritschel, and he's not the only one who does this in the 19th century, there are others, but, but he's probably the most uh, the most uh, you know familiar to most people along with uh, von Hoffmann would be the other who does this um, and what both of them argue is that there is this big divergence between you know Luther and Melanchthon where Luther is the purer theology and by purer theology really they think that they can take liberal theology from Luther um, or apply Luther to you know apply Kantian categories to Luther and stuff like that, uh, and that Melanchthon is kind of the beginning of this you know overly scholastic form of theology, and that Melanchthon is kind of bringing back the scholastic categories and then leads Lutheranism in a bad direction. So he's leading Lutheranism back to medieval scholasticism. Luther you know rejected all of this stuff and and he brought it back. Um, and you don't see this just in in those theologians, but that continues through the the 20th century. Um, you know, the Luther Renaissance. Some of those writers argue in a very similar way for this divergence between Luther and Melanchthon. Uh, Adolf von Harnack, the the church historian, who is very opposed to the Hellenization of cre- the Christian faith. You know, he's got this thesis in the early church that there was this process of Hellenization where Greek thought forms ended up uh, corrupting the the more Jewish view of the early church of Christianity, and he sees kind of a similar process between Luther and Melanchthon so that Luther uh, is really the, the the high point of theology or the Archimedean point, as you know Gerhard Ebeling describes it, so that uh, Luther is this great figure in the church, and then Melanchthon kind of screws everything up, and then the rest of Protestantism, including Calvin, Calvinism, and scholastic Lutheranism, all is falling from the pure fount that is Luther. And, you know, Reformed scholarship does this in the same way with Calvin. Eventually, they start doing this Calvin versus the Calvinist thing. And um, so so the idea is that Luther and for some Calvin were more pure reformers and then Melanchthon and Beza are the ones that kind of distorted these things. So that is a thesis that exists. And that was promoted also by some of the more existentialist kind of theologians who were more opposed to a uh, defining the law as, as an eternal law, which is inherent uh, in God's own character, that the law is a reflection of God's eternal will. Um so that it's seen that at least the way that the third use of the law was explained in later scholasticism is really more Melanchthon taking it from Calvin than it is Luther who denied the third use of the law. William Lazarus and others from uh, Valparaiso, for example, would say that. Um, and, you know, you find a similar kind of attitude of, you know, Steve Paulson writes about how the the process, the history of Lutheranism is kind of the history of going away from the pure theology of Luther. And, and sometimes Melanchthon is blamed as the beginning of that. Though Paulson doesn't particularly blame uh, Melanchthon for that, as he actually kind of praises uh, his, his early systematic work as not being overly scholastic. But you know, nonetheless, the, the point is, yes, there, there was a fr- phase in Luther scholarship that did say that there was this broad uh, divergence between Luther and, and Melanchthon. Um, but that's really been challenged today. It's been challenged by, I think, the majority of Luther scholars. And, and that's not to say that no one believes that there is a divergence between the two anymore. Um, and, it, you know, look at someone like... Um, you know, Robert Kolb has written on this, um, or Charles Arend, I know, has written on this. Uh, you can look at Bengt Hagland has written an article. You know, there have been several published books and articles which interact with this idea of Luther and Melanchthon in their kind of budding heads. And especially through, I think, the work of Richard Muller, um, as well as Robert Preuss, there's kind of been an understanding that you know, Protestant scholasticism in general was not as far from the reformers as was once previously thought, and and that the sources themselves really weren't dealt with you know, first on a first-hand basis, they were just kind of second-hand references to, well, all this stuff after that got bad, and sometimes Melanchthon is is thrown in with all of that. 
Um, so modern scholarship has not really proposed that there is a huge divide between Luther and Melanchthon, but James White's comments don't seem to be coming from that perspective, though. I, I don't see that he's taking this from a perspective of 20th century Luther scholarship in the early 20th century, late 19th century that, that tried to argue that, um, you know, a third use of the law was something that Melanchthon had, that Luther didn't, and, and Melanchthon brings in a kind of idea of verbal inspiration that Luther didn't have. You know, I don't think that that's what, what James White is, is getting at. So, so so I don't think that's that's where he's coming from here, um, which makes it kind of hard to see. Well, then what what is he saying? Um, and the implication, at least as far as I'm understanding it from other comments, is as I said, Luther was really more close to um, Calvinism, and Melanchthon was more close to something else. And you know, to call Lutheranism Melanchthonianism is strange. Because it's well known, and if you know anything about Lutheran history, like anything, like at all, you read a chapter on Lutheran history in a you know a undergrad textbook, you know this, okay? That that there are groups of Lutherans um, following Luther's death that get into battles over various theological issues, and the name of the two groups generally, you know, and there's been some discussion as to whether they can really be categorized in these strict categories or whether the categories are accurate or not, but you know. It's been recognized that generally there are two groups. They're labeled the, the Philippists, meaning the followers of Melanchthon, okay, Philip Melanchthon. And then there are, are those who are called the Nasio Lutherans or the, the true Lutherans, you know, the, the old school Lutherans, the one who are holding to the pure doctrines of Luther. And what is recognized is that in those debates between those two groups, the Lutheran confessions themselves reject the teachings of the Philippists. In other words, there were people in the Lutheran church that were following more self-consciously Melanchthon than they were Luther, and they were explicitly rejected in our confessional documents. So if Melanchthon's views are rejected in our confessional documents in favor of those of Luther on areas of either real disagreement or, or perceived disagreement, um, then how are we now saying, well, yeah, they rejected the teachings of Melanchthon on various issues and affirmed those on Luther, but really they're just Melanchthonians. What, what basis are you getting this from? Um, now, if we're going to talk about Melanchthon and Luther and, and their divergence, really there's, there's three areas of divergence between them um, that, that are generally discussed. And I think Bank Taglin's uh, essay on this, and I can't remember the, the title of it, um, but there was a an issue of um, Concordia Theological Quarterly, and it could have been back when it was still the Springfielder, I'm not sure. Um, but he has an article in there, and then there's some response articles as well. But but this is a good good set of articles to kind of get a picture on the discussion. It's, it's free, though, by the way. On, uh, online, you, you can still ac you can access those without, you know, having a JSTOR account or something like that. Um, so the three major areas that scholars have proposed are in terms of free will, uh, the Lord's Supper, and then in terms of um, church fellowship. And there's the adiaphora issue as well, but I'm not going to really touch on that. But uh, in terms of, of church fellowship and in terms of can we compromise on certain things, which gets into adiaphora as well. But it is a broader issue than just that. And let's kind of go through each of those. Well, the first is this issue of free will. Now, Melanchthon in his last edition of Loca Communes, um, says that there are three causes of, of conversion. And he's using the Aristotelian language of, of causation here that was common in scholasticism, both Roman Catholic and Protestant. And when he's discussing this, he says there are three causes, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and man's will. Now, the statement itself is actually pretty ambiguous, and it's not quite clear what Melanchthon is saying, because it's likely that what Melanchthon was actually saying was that, um, and some have argued that this is what Melanchthon was saying, is that the human will is not properly a cause of conversion in and of itself, but the, the human will converts, I mean, in, in other words, there's a real willing something that happens to the human will that is through the agency of um, the Holy Spirit and the means of grace. In other words, yes, my will changes in the process, but that change of the will is the work of God. So this would be similar to maybe how um, Jonathan Edwards, for example, speaks about the freedom of the will in terms of conversion. So that Melanchthon himself claims that he continues to be a monergist here. Now, 
I'm not a Melanchthon scholar, uh, and I, I know there's debates in scholarship. I can't contribute to whatever position I take with, with regard to Melanchthon's writing there. Um, but what I can say is that what happens with Melanchthon's students is that there are some who are very clearly leaning in the more synergistic direction. So that the human will does have something to say in terms of uh, conversion. Now, the the Philippists uh, who were labeled Philippists, who um, were definitely leaning in a more synergistic direction, um, they were those who fought against it. And, and against that, you'd have someone like Matthias Flaccius, um, who was kind of a leader in the Ignatio Lutheran movement, but he was a little bit extreme, and he actually ends up getting rejected in terms of some of his perspectives as well on, on human nature in Article 1 of the Formula of Concord. But um, as a result of the various debates between the, the two different groups, the Ignatio Lutherans and the Philippists, and there's probably all sorts of people in between, and those groups aren't really strongly, though they were definitely battling each other, um, it's not like everyone in one of those groups is really the same either. Uh, and in some ways, there's certain parts of the, the, the formula that are compromises, or, or to say that, that are at least trying to take into account the concerns of the Philippists in formulating ideas. So they're more careful, maybe, than some of the Ignatio Lutheran theologians could have been, especially someone like Flaccius. And that's why you really had to have someone like a Martin Chemnitz um, who does this. Now, Article 2 of the Formula of Concord actually deals with this issue of free will, and it deals with this issue of, of synergism. Now, Melanchthon himself is not named here, uh, but it talks about two sides, and um, uh, let's see, um, the, uh, I don't know how much I want to read of this because I really do actually want to read all of this, but anyway, if, if you have time, just look at Article 2 of the Formula of Concord yourself. Go to bookofconcord.org and check it out if you don't have a copy yourself. But uh, in Article 2 of the Formula of Concord, uh, the synergist view is rejected, and, and it's affirmed that there is no such thing as free will in terms of our relationship to God, in terms of our conversion, at least. Um, and there's a distinction made between things above us and things below us. In terms of things above us or spiritual things, there is no free will. Yes, in terms of things below us, we have free will to, you know, do just physical, regular, earthly stuff, okay? We can make decisions to sit in the chair we want to sit in. Um, this really actually would not go with Edward's uh, more determinist view of, of will, but anyway, that's not really the point. But um, there is freedom in terms of things below us, but there's not freedom in terms of spiritual things. And so conversion is solely the work of God. Man is purely passive in the act of conversion. He is not active at all. Now, in conversion, man's will is changed so that, yes, there is a real change in the will through conversion that one can now cooperate with the grace of God in sanctification. Okay, those things are all discussed in Article 2 uh, on free will in the Formula of Concord. But you have there, and this is usually the place where I hear Calvinists at least say, well, Melanchthon was all about free will. Luther was a monergist. Therefore, Luther, Calvinist, Melanchthon, Arminian, which aren't even appropriate categories to even use at that time. But uh, And then the formula of Concord, which if they even know what that is, oh, and the, the Lutherans just follow Melanchthon because they're synergists, they're Arminians. Total misunderstanding. Synergism is explicitly rejected, and the synergism that comes from the Melanchthonians, if you want to use that term, um, that is explicitly rejected. Now, the other issue is in terms of the Lord's Supper. Now, the difference between Melanchthon and Luther and the Lord's Supper is real. I think there's a real difference there. Now, in terms of the will, I, I do think that it's possible that Melanchthon is just using different language to get the same idea across, um, because Melanchthon always had, had a concern, and you see this uh, in, in a lot of the language that he uses, which is a little different than Luther's. He had a concern that God was... Uh, preserved from evil, so that God was not the cause of evil. And so because of that, he would use a lot more careful language when he's talking about free will and the nature of the relationship between God and the evil that's in the world. You see this in the Augsburg Confession, but you see this in Melanchthon's writings. Now, Luther isn't as careful on that issue because that's not his primary theological concern. You know, if you read the bondage of the will, he can just say things like, all things happen of necessity. You know, there's no such thing as free will. And Essentially, at heart, Melanchthon and Luther don't disagree on what they're saying, but they're using the terms differently, and they're fighting different battles, so they can come across as being very different. And, and we know that because Luther approved of things like the Augsburg Confession and the way that Melanchthon spoke about these issues. So, so there really wasn't, wasn't substantial disagreement there. Now, at the end of his life, did Melanchthon change his view? I'm not convinced he did. I don't know. Maybe he did. Um, but I still think there could be definitely continuity there between the two. Now, the issue of difference is the Lord's Supper. 
And Luther was very clear on the real presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Um, Luther just says, this is, this is the body of Christ. This is the blood of Christ. He kind of leaves it at that. Um, Luther initially wants to retain things like Eucharistic elevation. Um, you know, he, he does a lot of things that would probably make a lot of more, some modern Lutherans a little uncomfortable because he's very big on the real presence and even in terms of um, how one treats that real presence within the, the divine service itself. Um, and Melanchthon is, um, he believes in the real presence. Uh, and, and the way that, you know, Scare, David Scare uh, outlines the difference is he basically says for Luther, it's all, the, the, the primary focus is on the words of institution. Because God's word does what it says. When God's word proclaims that this is the body of Christ, it is. And when it proclaims that it's the blood of Christ, it is. That's it. Uh, and so there's more of a realist view of, of what's happening there. And for Melanchthon, on the other hand, it's more about the sacramental action of the church and it being Christ's body and blood as we receive it together in the church through liturgical action. So the emphasis is a little different. And because of that, you might be able to say, categorize Luther as a consecrationist, Melanchthon as a receptionist, which is a debate that goes on in Lutheran history later in terms of the nature of Christ's presence. Is it the body of Christ on the moment of consecration when the words are spoken or only in the sacramental action when the person receives the actual thing for the purpose of eating and drinking? Um, I think Consecrationism is obviously the right view, but you know, um, there, there is a, a difference between the two of them um, on that issue. That doesn't mean, though, that Melanchthon compromised his own view and said that there is no real presence of Christ in the Supper. He certainly did, I think, believe in it, but he was a lot more willing to compromise with the Calvinists. He was more willing to soften his language, where he, there's the altered Augsburg Confession. He's a lot more more willing to say, you know, well, I, boots are, yeah, we can agree and disagree and whatever. And um, Calvin um, interacts with Melanchthon. They know each other, okay? They write back and forth. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, when the whole Servetus thing happens, uh, Calvin writes to Melanchthon to ask for his advice. And, you know, their they're friends, are, they know each other, uh, they respect each other, and so Melanchthon is the one who actually opens up the door a little bit to Calvinism. And he's okay with more ambiguous statements about what real presence means in the Lord's Supper than Luther is. That, I think, is the biggest point of disagreement between the two. And again, the formula of Concord on this issue deals with it and is very clear that it accepts Luther's view, that it accepts the real presence of Christ. Um, and, you know, there still can be debate about consecration, receptionism. I, I think consecrationism is the confessional view, but... Um, but there can be some discussion on, on that issue. But the point is, you know, the formula makes it extremely clear. There is no compromise with the Calvinists at all. So I'm just going to read a little bit of, of what the formula states. And I'm reading from the Triglata translation, by the way. And uh, this is from Article 7. Okay. Uh, accordingly, with heart and mouth, we reject and condemn as false, erroneous, and misleading all sacramentarian opinions and doctrines which are not in accord with, but contrary and opposed to the doctrine above presented and founded on God's word, as when they assert that the words of institution are not to be understood simply in their proper significance, as they read, of the true essential presence of the body and blood of Christ in the supper, but are to be rested by means of tropes or figurative interpretations to another new strange sense. We hereby reject all such sacramentarian opinions and self-contradictory notions. Also that oral participation in the body and blood of Christ in the supper is denied by the sacramentarians and it is taught on the contrary that the body of Christ in the supper is partaken of only spiritually by faith so that in the supper our mouth receives only bread and wine. Um, Likewise, also, when it is taught that bread and wine in the supper should be regarded as nothing more than tokens by which Christians are to recognize one another. And it goes on and on and on. Um, but the point is that what happens throughout this is that every possible interpretation of the supper, point by point, that is from the sacramentarians, meaning not just Zwingli, but also Calvin and what is perceived possibly in Melanchthon, all of that's rejected. And so it's very clearly affirmed that Luther's view is the view of the confessional documents. And then we get to the final issue, and the final issue has to do with compromise, and uh, compromise in terms of things like church rights, and compromise uh, in various doctrinal issues, and, and willingness to work together with other groups despite disagreement, and to downplay areas of disagreement, because Melanchthon did that. He was willing to say, okay, yes, Rome will agree that we'll make these certain rights necessary in our church for the sake of, you know, coming together. 
and he did this with the reformed as well. He was a lot more willing to compromise. And on these points, again, there are specific articles in the formula of Concord that reject his views of these issues. Um, so what we see is that on every perceived issue of divergence between Melanchthon and Luther, our confessions explicitly affirm the teaching of Luther in opposition to Melanchthon. Okay, you see how wrong that perception is that Dr. James White is presenting. It's just blatantly false. And in even a cursory elementary examination uh, would tell you this. I mean, even some confirmation students in a Lutheran church could tell you this um, because it's just the very basics of what happened in the Lutheran Reformation. Um, so it's just false. It's false. All right, now let's move on to the next part. But very briefly, the... the, the in general, and you're going to find Lutherans are going to disagree with this, but in general, the concept is that Lutherans believe what's called the ubiquity of the body of Christ. They believe that the um, characteristics of his divine nature transfer over to his human nature, so that his physical body becomes omnipresent. All right. Uh, there are so many issues I, I, I could address here. I could spend a whole program on those, just those comments. Um, First of all, why are you saying Lutherans could disagree with this? Um, what Lutheran disagrees with the fact that there is an omnipresence of Christ's human nature? Now, in terms of confessional Lutherans, again, that is affirmed in our Formula of Concord. Uh, and there is a whole article in the Formula of Concord, again, on this issue. And so if he really knew our, our you know, confessions at all, this is Article 8 on the person of Christ, you would just say, okay, well, all confessional Lutherans believe X, Y, and Z. There might be those who reject the confessions, but the confessional Lutherans all believe this, because we do. Um, you know, Herman Sasse and others have, uh, I think, rightly said that really that's actually the heart of the disagreement between Lutherans and, and the Reformed, is over this issue of the nature of, of the presence of Christ's human nature. Um, you know, specifically dealing with uh, Zwingli's principle that the finite uh, cannot contain the infinite, which, of course, makes no sense of the Incarnation, but that's a whole other other discussion. Um, and so that really has been at the heart of these disagreements. Now, it is true that there are certain Lutheran lands, um, you know, Scandinavia, uh, that have not accepted the formula of Concord in their Lutheran uh, churches. Now, the reason is really more of a historical one than anything else, uh, which is that they were kind of seen as German debates, and they already had the Augsburg and they had Luther's Catechism, so why, you know, accept these other documents? Now, there are today confessional Lutheran church bodies in those countries which do hold to all of our confessions. Um, but when I've read, uh, you know, theologians from those countries in the scholastic era, meaning the 17th century, they have affirmed this as well, and I haven't seen a disagreement with, with it. Um, and so this is really has always kind of been at the heart of Lutheran difference with the Reformed is over this uh, dispute concerning Christ's two natures. So you don't make me to make qualifications, say, oh, well, some Lutherans don't agree with this, um, which is, again, this idea that Lutherans are just all a bunch of, you know, people who don't agree on anything, and we can just kind of say, well, no, no two Lutherans agree on anything. You know, they're, they're over here, they're over here. Um, and these are issues we all agree on. And like I said, there are arguments. You know, we got debates in Lutheranism too, believe me. That's not like they're not debates at all. There are debates about how to interpret our confessions on, on particular issues and things like that. But the things that you're talking about here, these are not those debated issues. Um, you want to see a good Lutheran debate, look up sanctification from Lutherans, third use of the law. There's where you'll get your big debate and, and how to interpret things and, and how to read certain sections of the formula and understand the, the nature of sanctification and what the third use of the law entails and things like that. But um, that's really, you know, the areas of, of disagreement, which isn't really at the heart of, of what's going on here. So that's the first point, that that's wrong. Okay, it's, it's not true that, yeah, there's a bunch of Lutherans that just don't agree with this. Uh, if you're talking about confessional Lutherans, yes, we all agree with this. Um, now, if you get to some of the other comments there, first of all, ubiquity of the human nature is not a term that Lutherans coined. That's a Calvinist term that they use to describe Lutherans, just like consubstantiation, again, which is used later as well, which is not a term that Lutherans ever used to define their view. I think we should let traditions define their own terms. And when somebody says they believe something, we should probably speak in a way that they would speak. That's kind of how, you know, honest discourse works, but hey. Um, and 
so that's another point. And, and the third point there is that he speaks about, first of all, a transfer of attributes, I believe is what he said. Really, it's communication. There is a there is an important difference between those ter- terms and some of the implications of what that might mean, um, specifically because attributes are not something separate from God's essence, which can be transferred, taken away from the divine nature and given to the human or something like that. And, and there is a communication of the divine essence interpenetrating the human essence so that the divine attributes are are worked through the human nature as an instrument, um, just as God does with the sacraments. Um, of course, in a different way in, in terms of Christ's human nature, but um, or like he does through, you know, miracles, through human stuff ordinarily. And, and the next is that he speaks about a physical pres- omnipresence of Christ's human nature, an omnipresence of Christ's physical body. Um, the idea of the omnipresence of Christ's physical body has never been the position of the Lutheran Church. That has always been something that Calvinists have thrown at Lutherans and have not actually read our confessions, because the formula of Concord actually deals with this, and it speaks about the omnipresence of Christ's human nature even being spiritual. Now, what does spiritual mean, of course, you know, because that term is kind of given a, uh, a, a, has weird connotations from, um, you know, Zwingli and others. So while Luther, Luther himself could say, yeah, uh, Christ's presence in the human nature is a spiritual presence, by that he doesn't mean um, that it is a spiritual presence in the sense that, you know, there's nothing really there. No, Christ's presence is actually there uh, in the bread and wine, uh, but something spiritual is going on. Uh, I mean, that is a, it's a spiritual thing, meaning it's not a physical thing in the sense that I am not partaking of Christ's body in the same way that I am eating, you know, a chicken wing when I'm chewing on it. And the reason why we've never said it's Christ's physical body or Christ is physically everywhere is, because that would imply that, you know, you have like a, a human body that's stretched out, that's just pulled out, and so that it now kind of fills all things in that sense. And this is what is referred to as a crude understanding, uh, a, a Capernaitic understanding. And these are things that our confessions actually say that are explicitly wrong. So it's not a, a physical presence in the sense of my physical body being on this earth. That's why Lutherans distinguish between different modes of presence. Uh, and we have to distinguish between different modes of presence because Jesus does. When he says, um, you know, when he before he ascends into heaven, he's about to leave, and he says, behold, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So in some sense, he leaves. In some sense, he stays. Sorry, I uh, just answered our church phone, and a resort was calling. Apparently, we had stayed there before, the church. I don't think that we've ever gone to a resort, as far as I know. And we were eligible for uh, some special offers. That's pretty exciting. Um, <laughs> sorry, now I'm all off track. This is what happens when I do my uh, podcast in my office. i got to pause it when I get phone calls. Um, but my point was, it's not a physical presence of Christ. Uh, it's not physical in the same sense that my body is physically sitting here. Uh, our confessions explicitly condemn the idea that we are tearing Christ's flesh apart with our teeth. But that doesn't make it less real. Uh, it is a real presence of a human nature. And human nature, by the way, is not the same as an omnipresence of a physical body, because a human nature is, is in its essence, more than just a physical body. Um, okay, so so that language is is very much imprecise, and it's not language that we ourselves would use. So that Jesus is present in, above, and around the elements. So the elements are not changed. They're not. There's no transubstantiation. But because of the ubiquity of the body of Christ, Jesus is physically present in the supper because his physical body is omnipresent. And so it's frequently been called consubstantiation instead of transubstantiation. Um, and that's why in the Marburg Colloquy, uh, 14 out of 15 points of theology were agreed upon by the Lutherans and the Zwinglians, but that was number 15. And allegedly Luther wrote on his desk, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body, and would not, and it all blew up over that one, that one issue. Um, so that's what you're referring to, what you're referring, referring to there. And here's where all the Lutherans that are listening are just tearing their hair out by this point uh, in frustration of what's been said. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. The, first of all, uh, the, the, the first part of this, the, the phrase that he's trying to use is in, with, and under. He said, 
up over I don't know um, but in with and under is is the phrase that has has been used to describe the nature of Christ's presence I um, actually really don't like that phrase at all uh, I think it's horribly unhelpful um, I, I think it's an extremely unhelpful phrase because um, because of the way it's kind of been misconstrued because you know when the reformed here is talking about this they say well you're not saying that this is Christ's body you're saying that Jesus is basically saying in the words of institution, my body is in, with, and under this. You have to realize that the formula in, with, and under is just um, a combination of ways that Lutherans spoke about it. So they would say things like, um, I receive Christ's body in the bread, or the Augsburg Confession says, with the bread, or sorry, the Augsburg Confession says, under the forms of bread and wine, or they'd say, with the bread, I receive it. And all of those phrases are just kind of thrown together. It's not supposed to be an absolute formula of the nature of Christ's presence. The point of it is just to say, in, with, under, somehow, it's here. It really is Christ's body and blood. Okay, it really is. Um, and so it really is better to say, it is Christ's body and blood. It is also bread and wine. I think that's the way, Lu- that's certainly the way Luther himself speaks of it. Look at the small killed articles. Um, but anyway, um, that's that. That's you know not probably not the most important part here. But uh, Dr. White then uses the term consubstantiation. It's generally called consubstantiation. Now I guess he doesn't technically call it consubstantiation, but um, con- again, consubstantiation is a view that actually was taught by certain nominalists. It is not the view uh, of Luther or Lutheranism. We have never used the term. It is only a term that others have used of us. Again, he says that it's the physical body of Christ that is present in the supper because Christ's body is physically omnipresent. Um, the idea of a physical presence, again, is not what our confessions actually say. Okay, I'm just going to read a section of Article 7 of our confessions that talk about to this that say this, For in view of the circumstances, this command evidently could not be understood otherwise than of oral eating and drinking, so real, through the mouth, not just by faith. Okay, so the oral eating and drinking of Christ's body and blood is what distinguishes this view from the Reformed, which is just that it's by faith. It's not actually oral. Um, however, not in a gross, carnal, Copernicanic, but in a supernatural, incomprehensible way. Um, so... So there is not language of a physical presence of Christ's body. That's that's really not uh, the language that Lutherans have ever used to describe our, our position. Um, and I have another uh, section here from Article 7 that I want to read as well. Uh, from these words, Dr. Luther... These words of Dr. Luther, this, too, is clear in what sense the word spiritual is employed in our churches with reference to this matter. It, in other words, it's called a spiritual presence. Um, but we have to understand what that means, of course. Um, for to the sacramentarians, or the Zwinglians, this word spiritual means nothing else than a, than a spiritual communion when through faith true believers are in the spirit incorporated into Christ, the Lord, and become true spiritual members of his body. But when Dr. Luther, or we employ this word spiritual in regard to this matter, we understand by it the spiritual, supernatural, heavenly mode according to which Christ is present in the Holy Supper, working not only consolation and life in the believing, but also condemnation in the unbelieving, whereby we reject the Capernaic thoughts of the gross and carnal presence which is ascribed to and forced upon our churches by the sacramentarians against our manifold public protestations, which is exactly what Dr. White is doing here. In this sense, we also say, uh, wish the word spiritually to be understood when we say that in the Holy Supper, the body and blood of Christ are spiritually received, eaten and drunk, although this participation occurs with the mouth while the mode is spiritual. So again, it is spiritual, it is not physical. It is not physical, not in the sense that Christ is not really there with his human body and his blood. He is, because Christ says it, but not in the sense of cannibalism, okay? It's not in the sense of the way you tear apart the flesh of an animal that you're eating. And and that's the implication of language of of a a physical presence of Jesus. So it's not a physical presence, it's a real presence of Jesus' divine and human natures, including his actual body and his actual blood. But that is not the same thing as calling it spiritual because he or physical because he is present in a heavenly mode, a different mode. Um, which, again, I, I think it's necessitated by Scripture that we do that because we have these distinctions where Christ is obviously present in one way while he's walking on the earth. That's what usually people mean by physical presence. And he's present on the earth still, but not in that same way that we can, you know, you can talk to him face to face. You can eat eat with him uh, at sitting at a table together, you know, take a picture of him. You know, that that's not uh, the same. 
All right, so that's kind of what I wanted to do. Uh, I just wanted to go through those comments. That's the end of them. Um, I could have spent a lot more time on any of these, but hopefully this helped. I know it's kind of strange because I'm just going through one small bit of comments that was just at a Bible study, um, but I thought it merited attention because I haven't asked this a bunch of times um, over since I've probably done this podcast. I think since I've started, people have asked me to do this. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've interacted with Dr. White before on – it's been a while, uh, I guess, but I have. I, you know, I know he's popular online, so people send me his stuff a lot. Um, so I've interacted with him on Limited Atonement a long time ago, but uh, in more recent years, I've interacted with him on baptism and um, justification, justification in the life of, of Abraham. Um, so anyway, hopefully you found this helpful, uh, and hopefully, you know, those who are Reformed who are listening who maybe aren't sure about Lutheranism, hopefully this cleared up some misunderstandings and, and maybe helped you come to a better, more nuanced understanding of exactly where we're coming from on these issues. So if you hear this, uh, and maybe Dr. White, if you do listen to this, I have no idea if you listen to this, but if you do, um, maybe, you know, this will be helpful in, in kind of giving a, a view of where we're coming from, because I know you're not very, you know, well-informed of, of Lutheranism. I know it's not really where you've interacted. So hopefully this has been, um, you know, beneficial. All right. So thanks so much for listening. If you have comments or questions, send them to me at justincenteryahoo.com. You can follow me on Twitter, uh, which is at Just and Center. Like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Center. Thank you so much. We will see you next week. God bless. <laughs>